Hi, um, I'm Samet. I work on machine learning frameworks. Uh, I started the PyTorch project at Facebook, among other things. And uh, I'm going to talk today uh, about machine learning frameworks, how they've evolved within certain dimensions of interest, and uh, within this, this framework that you can think about, uh, I'm going to talk about how they will continue evolving going forward. And I, I talk about the future as a distribution of things. And uh, this talk is 30 minutes and the field, you can talk about it for days. So obviously, uh, the talk is going to be simplified in, in various ways. So uh, please bear with me on that note. But I think I still think just talking about a few dimensions here and uh, talking through machine learning frameworks and their evolution within these dimensions is going to be pretty useful. Okay, so let's start. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, three people, uh, three personas. Uh, the first one is modeler. A modeler is someone whose job it is to look at the data uh, and uh, they assess the quality of the data. Uh, they ask, hey, do I need more labels? And then they start doing pre-processing or feature engineering. And then uh, they pick some way to do machine learning. They build an architecture. And then they encode enough, prior, enough priors into the learning, either via some tweak of the architecture or some you know, regularization scheme. And then uh, they build a training pipeline. They do machine learning to solve some tasks, either of research interest or business interest. And then there is uh, the second person I call prod. And prod is typically um, the person who, who modeler goes to when they actually want to reliably ship something uh, into some critical part of uh, some tasks, so reliably ship it to what we generally call production. So a prod usually tries to make sure you're able to version your model so that in case something feels wrong, they can roll back uh, and that you're able to um, version the data that comes in and goes into the, the, the models when, they, when they're trained. Um, and they also generally make sure that all the metrics uh, that they monitor are in within acceptable ranges and they um, make sure that new models that modeler has given them are within acceptable, acceptable ranges of performance uh, to keep costs or power uh, down and uh, they make sure to do that in coordination with the third person I call compiler. And what does compiler do? Compiler's job is to map models um, that are either the, the modeler has given, either for while they're still training the models or when they enter production, uh, to map those models as efficiently as possible onto hardware. Um, that could be server hardware, that could be accelerators, that could be phones, that could be some embedded systems, that could be the Mars rover, anything. Um, so their job is to squeeze the best performance out of the models, uh, either maybe say performance per watt or performance per second or performance per dollar. Uh, that's pretty much it. And so compiler can even be even though the term is compiler, they can even be a hardware uh, implementer. You know, they just build new hardware, someone like NVIDIA. Okay, so let's talk about how the software stack, uh, forget, don't forget the personas, but uh, I'm gonna just quickly talk a little bit about how the software stack uh, has evolved over time and that's kind of important and then we will actually tie this to the personas. So before deep learning got popular before 2012, uh, you typically had a software stack that somewhat looked like this where a lot of focus was on pre-processing, feature engineering, post-processing and so you had domain specific libraries for that and for the machine learning models themselves they had a very small uh, way to interact with 
software packages or libraries that that um, built those machine learning models and train those machine learning models for you. Um, so if you ever use XGBoost or Scikit-Learn or Wopel Wabbit, um, you are you you generally build you you give some kind of like configuration of what model you're building, what learning rate or regularizer or how many trees uh, in the forest and so on. And you, once you build that config, you know, you give that to a factory and then along with that, you, you give your data that is in some pre-processed or clean form. And then the, the, the engine, the software engine that implemented a particular machine learning algorithm just handles the entire stack of the training loop and, uh, and you know, all the implementation details of the model. And then uh, pre-2012, they mostly mapped to CPUs. So something like XGBoost would specialize uh, a lot for, for gradient boosted trees to always you know, have the best performance in register of CPUs and do all kinds of tricks and uh, things that are very specialized to boosted trees that make it go faster. And then uh, the one thing to recognize here is the model in this context is typically a, a configuration uh, that is generally small and um, usually readable by humans and then a blob of weights that are stored on some blob format, maybe on disk or, or in memory. So enter deep learning. And, you know, late 2012, deep learning got popular. Deep learning is nothing but neural networks or uh, differentiable learning. And uh, it got popular and hence came the frameworks that enabled modelers and compilers and prod to, to practice deep learning. So in the post deep learning world, this is how the stack looks like. So the stack looks like you have a very large API surface in the middle. So mainstream deep learning frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow have thousands of functions in their API. And these thousands of functions are stringed together by modelers to build models. And they can look uh, like you know, all forms of shape and size. And below that, you have data structures, typically tensors, uh, say dense tensors or sparse tensors, or within dense tensors, you can have layouts uh, of memory that might make computation more or less efficient. And then uh, you have a bunch of hand-optimized functions that are typically written by high-performance computing experts that map these API APIs onto efficiently onto accelerator hardware. Uh, you also, uh, in the last few years, have been seeing compilers pop up. So XLA or TortScript or um, TVM are, uh, are, are examples of compilers that take um, whole models described in uh, the APIs of these frameworks and they map them more efficiently to hardware than uh, stringing to their, together hand-optimized functions. And lastly, you typically have a distributed transport layer that makes, enables these models to run on multiple devices at once or multiple machines at once. Um, and on top of this API, you have domain-specific libraries that make it easy to train your models uh, within particular domains. Like for example, you might have computer vision specific pre-processing or functionality that all computer vision people can use together. Um, NLP, audio, they, they generally come in all flavors and sizes, but you also have high level frameworks such as um, Fast AI or Keras or PyTorch Lightning, who try to bring that pre deep learning uh, convenience of uh, quickly describing what you want to do or quickly fitting your data to your model instead of verbosely implementing everything uh, manually. Uh, and then on top, you have prod tooling such as uh, TFX or TorchServe or um, you know various kinds, SageMaker. Um, 
or um, the Spark AI starts to, uh, is starting to have uh, some tooling. So the general mainstream deep learning frameworks uh, do a full vertical integration uh, across the stack to make things pretty efficient. Uh, there are particular solutions uh, by various parties that only focus on particular parts of the stack and they interface cleanly with the rest of the stack. Um, so one thing to recognize here is in, in this post deep learning mainstream machine learning frameworks, PyTorch and TensorFlow model is described as code, uh, typically code in, um, in some language. That is basically, it's not a configuration file or a JSON blob anymore. It's actually complicated um, code, which can have loops and various structures that you typically define, um, uh, associate with the programming language. And then weights, weights are the same. They are just blobs of numbers that are stored somewhere. Um, so, it wasn't always like this. That, that picture didn't always look like this. So just after deep learning got popular, uh, you had various frameworks, CUDA ConNet, which was the framework that started the revolution, and then Cafe One, and then I used to use this framework called AB Learn. And uh, they had a much smaller API surface, and they had lesser data structures, they had only hand-optimized functions, they didn't have compilers, they typically didn't have distributed support, they didn't have much going on, and they didn't have an ecosystem of domain-specific libraries or utilities on top of them. Uh, and in their regime, model was still described as a config, you know, like as a protobuf or a JSON, or like customly defined configuration files and weights. So it was still basically transitioning from that pre-deep learning world uh, and that was what was most convenient. And then slowly uh, the mod, uh, but you actually had counter examples as well. So Tiano, which was actually much very ahead of its time, had model being described as a symbolic graph. Uh, and uh, what that, that you know, the large API surface and a, 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 a basically makes writing the framework really hard. So Tiana had a compiler, the compiler was really slow or wasn't very efficient, and that largely uh, made things very difficult. Um, and uh, eventually things evolved uh, where there were, I think, tens of frameworks and they all have evolved to only two surviving as mainstream frameworks, and those two uh, are PyTorch and TensorFlow, and they both do model being code and weights. And uh, one thing to ask ourselves is why did we enter this model equals code regime? You know, why didn't we just stay with config files and so? And one of the reasons is basically modelers were pushing the limits of frameworks uh, and they were doing, they were implementing ideas that looked more and more like real programs. They had dynamic control flow, dynamic shapes, basically uh, the shape of the input tensor is changing from one iteration to the other, typically seen in object detection or NLP. Or if you looked at say GAN training, it was very different from say standard image classification or you know, any kind of classification where Typically you just did forward, backward, and then update, and then went to the next iteration, forward, backward, update, but GAN training changed that loop, which means some internal details of these ML frameworks were no longer compatible with uh, what modelers wanted, or and uh, semi-supervised learning take that, takes that to even more extreme. Schemes like BYOL, which, uh, or SimCLR, which became recently popular, they they have a very complex uh, training regime uh, and the training loop itself is very involved. So again, uh, this the, the whole uh, field evolved towards convenience of the modeler, convenience of expressing ideas of modelers. And it did come at a big cost. Both compiler and prod 
were generally unhappy because they their lives got worse like they it became harder for them to write a compiler or map efficiently to accelerator hardware if you're talking about more general programs and same with prod like if model is a config plus uh, plus weights prod could easily version models uh, and such but that wasn't the case anymore with model becoming code then prod had to figure out how to debug models in production and all kinds of nasty issues and prod wasn't happy with this regime either and isn't so uh you can ask oh there's three people uh somehow model equals code st stuck uh, and then uh the second question you can ask is why do we have such a large api surface that's not where we started right cafe or but a continent had typically a very small API surface. And again, it has to do with the fact that every few months people publish uh, some disruptive new results uh, that, that involve some new building block or some new training regime that, that uh, has to be expressed uh, as in, in different terms than, the, than a previous mid-level building block. So, uh, for the large part, we had these ML frameworks evolve towards very low uh, level or mid-level building blocks and a lot of them to express all the mathematical functions and ideas that modelers had. It again was because of the convenience of the modeler and it came at a cost that compilers and prod were, were even more unhappy. So why did modeler get so much leverage? Like, if there's three people in in this stack, in in this in this ecosystem, why is modeler getting so much importance? Why do they have so much leverage? And that's a fairly important question to ask. The reason is because modeler um, is credited largely with making progress in the field. So AI after after 2012, slowly increased in hype to a point where everyone wants AI to do everything in the world. Um, and modelers have been credited with trying to keep up with going towards that hyped up world and making progress. And so creating there, they've been the ones who are creating all the new value. So um, the world has been evolving. I mean, the, the AI, ML compiler, software, whatever stack has been evolving to be taking care of modelers, and uh, and that's that has been almost existential for compiler and prod to survive. Um, for for the large part, uh, the the there seems to still be progress uh, using uh, whatever modelers do. So. That's the way the field is going. Um, compiler isn't happy, right? Compiler is looking at themselves and they're like, oh, these three year disruption cycles um, where some fundamentally important architecture that I thought will be important for the next 30 years is no longer used. I mean, you can look at, say, LSTM or AlexNet or VGG or Inception and all these like very popular architectures of their time that people were universal, almost universally using uh, only three to five years later, like no one uses them. I mean, LSTMs are old, but they started getting popular sometime in 2014, again, because of um, work out of uh, Google. But um, that, and that's what I'm referring to. Like they, they got popular and then once transformers came out, no one's using LSTMs anymore. So if someone somewhere, uh, and I know of uh, a few people, uh, tried to build specialized hardware or compilers or implementations of software that are handwritten, that are very specialized to say, LSTM and ResNet 50 and that's that's pretty much all it does but it does that a hundred times better or some some promise like that um, and but then to develop that software or hardware they would take three years well by the time they actually ship these things are no longer used and that's a problem 
So compiler is generally not happy that the only stable primitives that um, that they could they have been able to work with are convolution and general matrix multiply. That's also why GPUs are still extremely dominant and haven't really given uh, up their market share to um, more specialized hardware yet. So uh, what does compiler actually want? You know, what do they want that is better? They want something that looks like Cafe One. They want a stable high-level IR that is small and closed within itself. And uh, they just want to be able to, for it to not change. So like they can build some specialized high performance uh, expertise to map that more efficiently to new hardware or just build new hardware that executes this, this high level set of programs more efficiently. But modelers keep expanding the operator set and they keep breaking all kinds of fundamental abstractions uh, and keep, keep uh, going lower and lower down the stack and they keep giving trouble to uh, the compiler. And the other, other persona that's not happy is Prod. Prod wants easily versioned protobuf-like models. They want to be able to roll back. They, like, they want to do very simple things so that they can keep, if something goes wrong, there's very few variables that actually uh, change. Um, they don't want you to pull some random Python function from some random Python package on the internet and then use that within your model because then that model has to ship to production. So prod between you writing the model and then them shipping it, they have to figure out how to strip the model of that Python function or figure out that it's actually safe and shippable or you have some constraints with production, right? You might say, let's say you had to ship it to Android or something, then it's a lot of work to ship Python uh, into some app on Android, right? So, uh, so Prod isn't generally happy with doing crazy things and Modeler just does crazy things. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, Modeler's leverage is that every three years, they seem to have very big disruptions and every few months they seem to have incremental disruptions uh, and the pace of value creation hasn't been slowing down there seem there still seems to be gas in the tank so one of the reasons i would say pytorch was successful is uh because it put modelers at the center of the universe i i, I used to talk, um, give talks in the early days where I said, hey, I don't know if PyTorch is the fastest framework in the world. It might even be 10% slower, but it will give you more flexibility and debuggability and like help you express your ideas better. And what that did is it made modelers' lives easier. And uh, the compiler and prod people back then were like, yeah, but we will never ship this into production. And then what ended up happening was because modelers cr created future value and that future value depended on all this flexibility, compiler and prod actually had to come around to, to come to terms with the new reality. Um, so um, let's talk about the future. Modelers leverage, when does it end? Will it end or will it maybe still increase? Is there still like, gas in the tank for modelers to keep out innovating and keep getting credit for progress in AI. And uh, so uh, compilers and prod will continue to underfit to the problem and be under leveraged in doing a better efficiency job uh, if they, they lived in a different, more stable world. Um, whenever we talk about future, we talk uh, I typically think of it as a distribution over chains of events. You say, well, this thing can happen with the probability X, and then if that happens, this next thing can happen, and then you just chain them. So I'll talk about a few events that could happen and how the, the ML framework stack would change. So um, let's see the effects of a few possible events. 
The first event is, let's say, today transformers and connets make up for the majority of uh, what people think are um, the answer to everything. Um, let's just hypothetically say that that actually becomes true and that they just become the stable dominant architectures where dominance like they take all the all the heavy parts of the distribution um, of architectures that that people use then what would happen to this diagram from before well the api surface of uh the fra for frameworks that are needed to be mainstream will actually reduce uh, and um, the uh, the the uh, the the data structures then will shrink. We we wouldn't need so many like you know tensors with five layouts and all that. And then um, pretty much everything under the stack will just have a much much easier time. So the number of hand optimized functions will get will shrink. The compiler will have an easier job. The hardware people can start specializing more and more to um, say the shapes and sizes of the types of convolutions or matrix multipliers or whole transformer blocks that they need to compute. Um, I don't know if that happens. Uh, let's go back to that and finish my thought. I don't know if that will happen, but if it does happen, that there will be a next wave of frameworks, which will again, look like the classical frameworks where they will just drive everything with config files and then specialize. Uh, you don't have to expose a much more generalized scientific computing framework to the general public. And so someone like um, Hugging Face is already doing this, might you know become more dominant temporarily. There will be other players that come in to, that try to take, um, take charge of uh, this insight. Uh, let's talk about a second event. Let's say you're uh, scale, uh, there is some hardware that looks very different from all the existing accelerators. And then there is some obscure, um, um, not obscure, but some not as used uh, machine learning models, such as probabilistic graphical models, um, or even some popular ones such as sparse neural networks that have not been mapped efficiently enough to the current accelerators. Let's say they were mapped onto some um, hardware that looks very different, like Cerebrus, and uh, there are some disruptive results that are shown. Then pretty much the entire stack of machine learning has to be rethought from scratch, and it will be a very, very, very disruptive uh, event and uh, new frameworks that actually enable that work will take the mantle and it can actually end up being a transformative event that gives an opportunity for new languages like Julia to, to start taking charge of uh, the, the field. Right now, no one wants to move from Python because they don't, they don't have enough incentive to. So it could create an incentive as such that can uh, make such a change and uh, that would be interesting and exciting and I would definitely look forward to something like that. Uh, the third event I want to discuss is let's say um, you, had a, you had a particular uh, regime where models were actually first strung together from a bunch of pre-trained prior surveys and then hence models became much more data efficient. They didn't need as much uh, labeled data. Um, so this would, I think, typically, uh, it depends on the, the priors and how they're expressed, but let's say the priors are neural networks, then uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow will probably continue uh, their status quo, but then there will be whole websites that are about selling priors and uh, which are about um, discovering priors, websites that are going to democratize prior discovery and usage and there will probably be whole new sets of people trained to know which priors are better than the other and there might even be um, um, <laughs> uh, neural network architectures that predict which priors to string together for which problem um, and uh, 
if they are not, if priors are not just neural networks, but they're, they could be neural networks or mathematical functions of various kinds, then we need to figure out how the, the way these prior pipe the priors like the pipeline if you if you want to pipeline the priors you need to be for how they interoperate and talk to each other um the only way for mainstream frameworks to stay relevant within all this is if they can uh keep a very high velocity mainstream mainstream frameworks are very large and complex pieces of software and they are being worked upon by lots of people so if there's a change in the field and they don't keep up uh, fast enough they eventually will die so the only way they can actually keep up is they maintain a very high velocity and there will be specialized tooling that comes in uh, all the time because specialized tooling that is more niche, more specific, uh, is not doesn't have the baggage that comes with moving slow. So they can just move faster, they can be more efficient. They won't have the advantages of full vertical integration. So if mainstream frameworks do move faster, then they will, uh, they will just um, be able to um, kill specialized tooling over time. So uh, the last words I wanted to leave with uh, with my talk is in science, progress is uh, a combination of having great ideas and having the tools to execute those ideas. If either one is stuck in a local minima, then all progress will stop. So let us continue to make progress by being open to both new ideas and new tools. Thank you.